Coming up, we head to the Great Barrier Island off Auckland's east coast. I've hooked up on a good one here. This has got some nice pull to it. The fish-rich waters hold more than a few surprises for me and the team. Oh! And that's fishing. The coastline of the barrier provides Darren with a fantastic feast. He's in the net. And that may well be the fish of my lifetime. This is going to be a real offshore adventure today on Fishy Business. We're heading out from Omaha, heading out to the barrier. Going to take Lance to some of my favourite secret fishing spots. It's not an area you get to fish all the time because the barrier, it's about 60 k's offshore so uh, weather can restrict you, but today it's perfect and we're going to go and chase some big fish. Aotea, or the barrier as is more commonly known, got its name from the great explorer Captain Cook who noted the islands acted as a barrier from the swells of the mighty Pacific Ocean and the Hauraki Gulf. We've arrived at the barrier in an area called Miner's Head. It's a really good area. It falls away into deep water. Um, you can see Miner's Head up here in the background. Lots of mussels and kelp on the rock. So what we're going to do is start by prospecting with soft baits. And then if we hit an area where the fish seem to be on the chew, we might set up and have a bait fish. Good snapper can often be found hunting in the washes around offshore islands and the sounder was showing signs of fish life. God, it just smells of fish almost, doesn't it? Look at that. This area is amazing. Half a dozen casts drifting down the rock face and uh, I've hooked up on a good one here. My first fish of the morning. Started off and I thought it was small but it's um, grown a bit already. This has got some nice pull to it. Oh yes, and not a bad looking first fish for the day. Got him beaten now. I'll just slip him in the net. Oh, there we go. That's a, a good fish to start our barrier journey. We had a few hits with our soft baits, um, but uh, it didn't really fire up as much as we wanted to. We got one nice fish, but what we've done is we've come down to an area called the Needles, and we're going to try a bit of stray lining here. This is an area renowned for big snapper, and we're going to put up a big burly trail and fish with stray line baits with no sinker, so they'll just wash down in the current. This is real fundamental fishing, it's really exciting, and it can turn on some pretty big fish. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a, a burly mate and put that down near the bottom and then I'm going to put on another burly sack closer to the surface and um, set that away so I've got a bottom and a top burly running. We're going to use a mixture of baits, we've got some pilchard, some mullet and some squid and if we catch any fresh bait like yellowtail mackerel or kahawai we'll use that for fresh bait as well because fresh bait works really well in these situations. But we've got some good quality frozen bait, we'll start with that and see what happens. First bait got nailed. Had it on the Daiwa bait running system. It just peeled me back. I think it's another quality barrier snapper. It's fighting pretty hard. When playing a snapper in rocky country, apply plenty of pressure and make sure you keep your line tight because you don't want the fish running around the rocks. Oh, yeah. <sighs> this is what you come to places like this for. Real fishing, nice quality fish. Oh, there we go. Might just grab the landing net.
Oh, there we go. Stray lining in, in shallow water, no sinker. They pick up the boat and they just go. Love it. Adam's been getting the lion's share of the strikes, so I've been feeling a little bit lonely on the other side of the boat. But all good things come to those who wait. I put a couple of squid on this time, actually. It's not a monster, but hey, uh, it's just nice to get a fish on the, uh, on the rod. And, and here it comes now. There we go. Like I say, not a monster, but uh, I'm happy to have the first barrier fish on board. We've decided to move because the current's changed at the top of the, or the bottom of the tide. So what we're going to do is move around the corner because we've got wind opposing the tide here, which is not ideal for bait fishing. So we're going to move to an area where we can hopefully get the current and the wind in the same direction. By just moving around the corner, we discovered another fishing opportunity. The water is absolutely foaming with fish. Not quite sure what it is. We haven't got the wire on top of them yet. We're drifting down towards them. But Lance is going to have a crack at them. You never know what to expect when you're driving around these workups. I just thought I saw a fin out of the water. I said to Adam, look at that. And it turns out it's a sunfish. Beautiful sunfish over there. You'll see its fin just roll out of the water. The sunfish is a massive, weird looking fish that loves to eat jellyfish. I just cast my uh, pirate jig over the sunfish. And lo and behold, as soon as it hit the bottom, Something has jumped on it with some gusto. Oh no, what do we have here? <laughs> you wouldn't it's believe it. a big it. scorpion fish, Lance. A massive one. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my biggest scorpion fish of the day. Not quite what I'm after, but we'll put him back. It's Lance's best friend, the granddaddy harpooker or scorpion fish. And once again, not uh, not a normal sort of fighting fish, more like a, d a dead weight. So we'll find out what it is. And it's a squid. We'll have him. Look at Beautiful. that. Beautiful. Get the net under him, Lance, so he doesn't get away. Got ourselves a nice squid here. Adam says we'll have that, and I'm not sure if he wants it for the dinner table or for fresh bait. We'll find out. Absolutely stunning. Just. Beautiful creatures. Adam's picking the spots beautifully today. We pulled into this uh, little area. We burlied up, like we said, and this is about my second bait. I did get a bite before, lost it, dropped it. And this one's got a bit more weight to it, so yeah, nice work, Adam. I've lost a couple today. I just don't want to lose this one. Just taking it nice and easy. I reckon this one's all right, eh? Yeah. Oh, I just don't. Play him, play him. <laughs> so nervous, I just want to get him in. Oh, this is good. This has got some weight to it. Oh! <laughs> and that's fishing. So the stray lining technique we're using is we're casting our baits well away from the boat. One of the real keys with this type of fishing is to make sure that your rig is properly weighted. You want enough weight on it so your bait will sink down to hit the bottom, not straight down, but as it drifts away from the boat. So if possible, use no lead. But if you have to, use the smallest amount of lead possible. And as the current changes, you will need to vary the amount of lead. So even in strong current areas, you could actually stray line with three ounces, four ounces of lead. And once you let your bait out, keep feeding it out so it drifts on a diagonal with the current and wait for the fish to pick it up you'll actually feel them hit the line as it's going down, and then you have to wait for them to run away with it. So that's the stray line part of it. You're stray lining it back to the boat. It's a very effective way of fishing, but the keys are stay in contact with your line. Whoa! Got him! <laughs> and be prepared for a strike. <laughs> that one was not on the bottom, it was still going down. And that's what happens when you're using this technique of fishing. The snapper come up your burly trail and grab those baits. And here he comes. A nice, great barrier. Eating size snapper. Fat as anything they are here. Beautiful. 
Next up, Darren shows us how to catch crays around the barrier while his buddy hunts for a feed. Now it's springtime, it's pretty cold and awful, but the barrier has all sorts of wonderful stuff to catch. So we're going to make this a bit of a smorgasbord type dive and we'll show you what the barrier's got to offer. We're going to have a go for snapper, butterfish, trevally, kawai, koru, crays. We might look for some scallops, mussels. We're going to give everything a go out here because it's the sort of place the barrier is, but the weather's not the flashest as you can see. It's uh, pretty grim, but it's always good underwater. I love the anticipation of a dive. Who knows what you'll see? Kawai could indicate kingfish in the area. I get down to the business of finding crays. Taking your time going down conserves air. It gives me time to scan the bottom for the best looking boulder. A good underhang is what I'm looking for. This one's perfect. Check the hole thoroughly before grabbing the cray. There could be an easier or bigger one underneath. I go for a clean underhand catch in this situation. It's best if the terrain allows. A quick check for eggs, all is good. Meanwhile, my dive buddy Dan Rogers has nailed his first species of the day, a panty-sized snapper. A good kelp bed is the best place to find crays. Dan's using the kelpers cover to ambush fish. Best to stay on top for this, but for crays it's best to get underneath. It means you can inspect the holes properly. This cray is not letting go. I use my body to leverage against the rocks to try and pull it free of its hole. They're incredibly strong for something so small. It's got eggs so it goes free. Remember don't take crays with eggs. It's illegal and if you want crays for the future, let them breed. Dan's gun has been fired. This time it's a kawai. These are great smoked. Notice how Dan is taking his time as he surfaces to get the kawai under control. This ensures he won't lose it. I like my wetty net bag clipped to my waist. It means I've got two free hands to grapple with the crays and there's minimal drag with these bags. Make sure you shove the cray to the bottom of the bag. If you don't, they'll shoot right back out. The kelp on the weed edge produces good butterfish for Dan's species list. These are really good eating. Because they're a weed eater, anglers really catch these fish. There's crays everywhere. Most are too small, but once you start to catch a few, you'll be able to tell how big they are by just looking at them. This bigger one is at an odd angle in a tight opening making it hard to reach. Dan's working the weed edge well. He gets down flat onto the sand, flicks some up to mimic stingrays feeding, which attracts smaller fish. Koharu is Dan's next victim. Koharu are a member of the mackerel family. They have very soft flesh, not unlike tuna. The weather is not nice above, but as I said before, it's not bad underneath. I'm in a dirtier patch of water than Dan, but for crays it's not really an issue. A crack like this needs a little respect. Getting stuck for a cray is not worth your life. I've got stuck in the past. It's not fun when you're holding your breath. This one gets his freedom and I get mine. Having fish attached to your body like Dan has is not recommended. Sharks could attack these, causing you injury, but being late winter, sharks tend not to be an issue. If it was summer, this is a no-go. I like to go in as slow as possible, making sure I don't smash into sea eggs. A head or an arm full of these can take years to heal, and in some cases you never get them out of your body. 
I've got a body full of them as it is. This cray's an easy one. It had nowhere to go. A good firm grip on his horns mean it can't escape. Notice how I'm floating to the surface. The weighting of my belt is spot on to make my diving in shallow water very safe. With Dan's species list and my crays, the day has been very successful. He's in the net. And that may well be the fish of my lifetime. With a 30 knot westerly blowing, the trip to the barrier with the wave runner would not normally go ahead. However, on this trip, I was loading it with the car onto the Sea Link Ferry. That's one of the things I love about the ski. It's so easy to just hook up and take anywhere. This allowed me to launch from the eastern side of the island to shelter from the wind, which was forecast to drop only briefly in the morning. The adventure for today was to try and find a nice barrier snapper. So as the sun came up, I headed out for a day I would never forget. Right, we have arrived at the spot. There's a bit of a channel between a whole lot of rocks. I'm gonna drop some burley into it, get some big baits down there, and see what we can pull out of it. The action was a little slow to start, but before long there were fish in the burley trail and they started to bite. On. Oh. Fishing a remote location like this, you never quite know what you're going to catch. As the burley disperses, all sorts of fish are drawn in, and the fast tail beat of this local definitely didn't feel like a snapper. Swam at the ski initially. Here he comes. Oh, that's why he's fighting differently. To Trevally. Here we go. Another barrier species. Little Trevally. Around the 37 centimetre mark, I suppose. We'll let him go. Beautiful sashimi, though. But I'll let him go. As this little guy swam away, something a bit more substantial came inquiring. Oh yeah, nice fish. Gotta get his head up out of the weeds. Just came and gulped down that whole squid. Feel the beat that snapper tail telling me it's a nice sized barrier snapper. Ooh. We've got some pool late in the fight. With crystal clear water, the dark red of this beauty was easy to see. Always a nice one. Another nice barrier snapper. Into the net he goes. <laughs> this guy was hooked quite deep, so rather than try and dig the hook out, it was safer to just cut it off and retie a new one. I would rather spend a dollar on a new hook than risk killing an otherwise healthy fish that I'm intending to release. Beautiful. Look at that. Beautiful 10 pounder. Look at that. How could you resist that? You can't. Not even at high tide. Let's get it out. I'd had a tip from a local that big squid baits were the way to go at this time of year. So I used two 7 bar o mustard hooks on an 80 pound trace with no sinker at all so that the bait was nice and natural. Shit's gonna get real. You ready? Yup. Good fish. Nice fish. Oh yeah. This could be the one. You never know when you're gonna get that big one. You come on trips like this for the fish of a lifetime. 
and you never know when that fish of a lifetime is going to jump on the end of the of the line. You've got to treat every fish like it is that fish of a lifetime. Be ready for it. Oh, he's got some pull. It's a beauty. He's in the net. And that may well be the fish of my lifetime. I've been searching for a 20 pounder for so long. And this will go very, very close. Have a look at that fish. That is a 20 pound fish of a lifetime. Caught on a jet ski during an overnighter to the barrier. I'm still shaking. That's how excited I am. Been chasing a fish like this for some time now. I've had a 20 pound once before when I was at school. But since I've been chasing it on a jet ski, it's been a little elusive. But take a look, because that is a fantastic fish in anyone's books. So fantastic, I'm gonna let it go. Fishy Business is proud to support Legacy, 